Greetings everyone, and a very happy new year to you all. In today's video, we are going to be talking about those who are termed in the Quran as the right-hand possessions. I have already made a video on slavery where I pretty much covered most of what these types of people are a reference to, so throughout this video, I will be reiterating some of the same points for those who might not have seen that video. In that video, I covered all aspects of slavery in the Quran, whereas in this video, I will only be covering the concept of the right-hand possessions. Please refer to that video if you want to know my thoughts on the topic of slavery as a whole. The topic of the right-hand possessions came up for discussion not too long ago when the terrorist group ISIS captured a group of Yazidi women and used them as sex slaves. They used their understanding of the Quranic portrayal of the right-hand possessions as well as the Hadith narratives to justify their horrid and inhumane behavior to the dismay of many people. The question of sexual slavery in Islam was then brought up, which prompted a lot of Islamic scholars and speakers alike to weigh in on the issue. Many of them condemned the way ISIS went about in implementing the practice, but a majority of them refrained from condemning the practice itself, whereas others maintained that the practice did not conform to Islamic law. So, in this video, we are going to focus on this issue and try and uncover the hidden meanings of the phrase. The Arabic phrase for right-hand possessions is ma malakat imayan, and it is this phrase which has been mistakenly abused to justify the mistreatment of other people for sexual purposes. For the sake of simplicity, I am going to be using the abbreviation MMA to refer to the Arabic phrase ma malakat imayan throughout this video. In the first part of the video, I am going to be breaking down the phrase, and then I will conclude by incorporating the phrase into the entire Quranic discourse. The two words that I am going to be focusing on breaking down are malakat and imayan. The word malakat comes from the triliteral root meme, lam, kaf, which can be translated to mean to take charge of, to possess, to have authority over, to have power over, to own, and so on. The word imayan is the plural of the word yameen, which can either mean right hand or oath. It has been used in the Quran to refer to both meanings by popular translators. But what is the correlation between the word oath and the right hand? I believe that the reason why the same word refers to both meanings is because when someone typically takes an oath, they typically do so by their right hand. Similarly, the right hand is seen to be the hand which symbolizes goodness, power, trust, authority, and so on. It is similar to the phrase, my right hand man. It implies a position of trust and honor. The significance of specifying which hand is taking charge in the MMA phrase is because the right hand, or even the right side, is typically seen to represent good. For example, the Quran speaks of the righteous people on the Day of Judgment being the companions of the right hand or of the right side, whereas the bad people are referenced to as the companions of the left hand or the left side. In the Old English, the word for right meant just, good, fair, proper, fitting, straight, and so on. It is a word whose implication is more of that of care rather than dominance. Thus, it is no surprise that the word oath would have a correlation to the word right or right hand, as the right hand symbolizes trust, care, and determination. So, how should the MMA phrase in the Quran be rendered? There are three possible candidates for its meaning, one, what the right hands or oaths have taken possession of. Two, what the right hands or oaths have taken charge of. 3. What the right hands or oaths have taken ownership of. Whichever of the translations one decides to use is absolutely fine in my opinion, as it does not linguistically violate the phrase. However, the issue is regarding what the Quran means when it uses the phrase. Can it refer to the owning of other people as property? If it is understood to mean slavery, then that is categorically forbidden in the Quran. For those who would like more information on that, they are welcome to watch my video on slavery, or the video titled, The Prophet Muhammad, Breaker of Chains. In my opinion, the first two renditions are more in alignment with the Quran than the third. But, what then about the word possession? If you possess something, 
doesn't that mean that you own it? Well, not exactly. Possessing something can just mean that something has been entrusted to you and you just happen to have it with you. It does not necessarily have to be yours. For example, if I say, I placed it in your possession, or he had it in his possession, that does not necessarily mean that the person in whose possession it was found was the owner of it, it could simply mean that he was merely holding it for somebody else. Thus, the MMA phrase, in my opinion, refers to certain people in the community whom certain other people would swear an oath to take charge of. These people could have been from any walks of life. They could have included previous slaves, war captives or prisoners of war, refugees, displaced people from war-tone regions, and those who had been placed in the care of somebody else because they did not belong to anyone in the society. The Quran does not specify exactly what the hands or oaths had taken possession of, but it can include these categories of people, depending on how the phrase is utilized in the Quran. This means that the verse in which this phrase occurs will determine what it is a reference to. So, one cannot simply say that it means war captives, and then apply that meaning to every single verse where the phrase occurs. One has to infer the category depending on the verse. In short, the MMA are a group of people who are undocumented within the society, and they do not have the same exact rights and status as everybody else. This can be inferred from the following verse, which states, As for those who seek documentation from among what your oaths have taken charge of, then document them, if you know there to be good in them. But do give them of the wealth which God has given you, and do not force your maidens into unwanted relationships if they would rather maintain their chastity. This verse informs us that the MMA could seek documentation in order to be recognized by the state and thereby fortify themselves as free members of the society and then enjoy the same rights as everybody else. Thus, with this verse, we can classify the MMA as people who had not received their documentation and thereby not fortified by the state. In other words, they were the undocumented. This was one of the ways through which the MMA could fortify themselves, which implied that, if an MMA had resided as a member of the community for a certain period of time and was seen as a productive member of society, then the MMA could seek this documentation of fortification, but only if there was good in him or her, as the verse states. Then document them if you happen to know there to be goodness in them, meaning if they lead productive lives and are productive members of the society. As for the treatment of the MMA, the Quran states in chapter 4, verse 36, Be in servitude to your Lord, and do not associate anything with him, and be of excellent character to the parents and the near relatives, as well as the orphans and the needy, and the neighbor of close proximity and the neighbor of far proximity, and the companion by the side, and the traveler, and what your oaths have taken charge of. Assuredly, God does not like one who happens to be self-centered, boastful. Thus, excellent treatment of the MMA is a prescribed requirement according to this verse, the same level of goodness that one is required to extend to one's parents and near relatives. So, if it is not the kind of treatment that you would want for your own family members, then you cannot impose it or carry it out on the MMA. Enslaving someone for sexual purposes goes in contradiction with this verse, especially since it involves abuse of a sexual nature, as we saw done by Isis, and as reported by several reports in the Hadith literature and by many so-called scholars of Islam. Similarly, the people of fidelity have been cautioned to give due shares to those whom their oaths or right hands have made binding, particularly when it comes to dealing out wealth or inheritance, as stated in the following verse, for each category of people have we assigned protective guardians over that which the parents and the near relatives have left behind. And those whom your oaths have bound, then give them their share. Assuredly, God is indeed over all things a witness. When the MMA become documented, they take on the status of a fortified person, the Quranic term of which is, Mosanet, if they are females, and Mosanin, if they are males. These terms come from the triliteral root, Ha, Sad, Noon, which means to fortify, to protect, to shield, to guard, and so on, hence why a person who is in a committed relationship, such as a marriage, is also referred to with the same term. Thus, 
the term can either refer to a person who limits his or her sexuality within the confines of a committed relationship, such as a marriage, or a person who restrains their sexuality from any person, meaning a celibate person, or a person who is documented and fortified by the state, thereby granting them all the rights that the state has to offer. So, the meaning of this term in this light is in reference to someone who is protected under law by naturalization, and as such they are considered free. A similar arrangement can likewise be observed even in today's societal structures. Societal classes have existed since the beginning of civilization, but they change as time goes on, so it was no different during the time of the prophet. In today's societal structures, within a given country, there are people who are citizens, residents, and those who are either refugees or stateless. Though these people may reside within the same country, they do not necessarily have the same exact rights and freedoms. Within a country, citizens enjoy many certain rights which are not enjoyed by the other classes of people. Those who are not citizens typically have to acquire citizenship through different means, such as residing in the country for a specific period of time and taking a specific type of test to assess their connection and affiliation to the country. In some countries, it is easier than others for one to acquire citizenship, and there are certain advantages that can propel a person's chances of attaining citizenship a lot faster, one of which is affiliation to a citizen either through marriage or family. It is much easier for someone who is a family member or one who is married to a citizen to acquire citizenship status. Furthermore, many women, even in today's societies, would prefer marrying someone who is a citizen of that particular country, rather than opt for someone who is not. I have inquired of countless men and women, both religious and irreligious, regarding their preferences in seeking a partner, and a great many of them would prefer someone who is a citizen as opposed to someone who is not. Because according to these men and women, it grants the relationship stability and ease when both partners are citizens. This is no different from how the societies were structured during the time of the Prophet. The MMA can to a certain degree, be correlated to what we currently understand today as residents, refugees, displaced people, or those who are stateless within a given country, and they had a less societal standing and limited rights compared to those who were documented and fortified under law. Some remained in these classes, whereas others found means out of them and eventually fortified themselves. We have already covered the one way in which an MMA may become documented, namely that of seeking documentation by leading a productive life and being a productive member of society. Another way in which the MMA could obtain documentation and thereby become fortified was through marriage, meaning that if they married a documented person, then they too would become documented and fortified. This is the very reason why the Quran encourages the marrying off of the MMA, in particular the slaves. Even according to the traditional stance on polygamy, it is maintained that one may marry only up to four women who are documented and free, whereas they may marry as many MMAs as they please. Though I do not agree with this sentiment on the issue of polygamy, I do agree that there is no limitation placed on marrying the MMA. The encouragement to wed off the slaves is found in chapter 24, verse 32, which states, And wed off the unmarried people from among you and the righteous ones from among your male slaves and your female slaves. If they happen to be poor, then God will certainly enrich them from His grace, for God is expansive of means, knowing. We similarly see the same encouragement being reiterated in chapter 2, verse 221, wherein the people of fidelity are advised to give preference to the faithful slaves over the associators when seeking a spouse to marry. The verse reads as follows, Do not marry the female associators until they have fidelity. For a female slave with fidelity is surely better than a female associator, even if she is more pleasing to you. And do not marry off your females to male associators until they have fidelity, for a male slave with fidelity is surely better than a male associator, even if he is more pleasing to you. Though the verse does acknowledge that there exists within the society a social discrimination based on class and status, it does favor a person of a lesser class but with integrity and good character over a person of a higher class who has bad character and without integrity. 
Thus, it encourages the people of fidelity to focus on the character of a person rather than class when choosing a partner. The reason for this preference according to the verse is because such people are they who invite to the fire, meaning that their actions are not good, and because they are not good patterns of behavior. Another reason for this encouragement, as I have already argued previously, was to fortify and to grant documentation to the MMA. And as I have stated already as well, the MMA were made up of different classes of people, and those who had previously been slaves were also among the MMA, and that is why the Quran is encouraging the people of fidelity to marry them off, as this will grant them the same status and standing in the society as everybody else. The Prophet himself is reported to have been forbidden from marrying any other women from among the documented women, aside from those whom he currently had at the time, as stated in chapter 33, verse 52, which states, Other women are no longer permissible for you, O Muhammad, from thenceforth, nor is it permissible for you that you exchange them for other wives. Even when their beauty or goodness might be pleasing to you, with the exception of what your right hand has taken charge of, and God is ever an observer of everything. Thus, this verse clearly prohibits the prophet from taking on any other wife, unless that wife happened to be from among the MMA. Those who seek to smear the message of the Quran with calumny claimed that this exclusion was to quench the Prophet's desires, however, this is an absolute slander and a false accusation, not to mention ignorant and foolish. If it was to quench the Prophet's desires, why forbid him from marrying the free women? The documented women saw themselves as more worthy of the Prophet's attention than the women from among the MMA, and as such, many of them considered it a noble stance to be married to a man of his status, as he was a Prophet of God. Thus, because of that, God disallowed the documented females for the Prophet, as there was more that could be done for the MMA than those females who already were documented and fortified, in order to show that the MMA were just as worthy in the Prophet's eyes as the documented women. Furthermore, it was to grant the MMA documentation within the society, and to make them as acknowledged as any other person, and to serve as a pattern for other faithful people to follow. Since the Prophet was doing it, the other people of fidelity were also expected to follow suit in this practice, which would eventually bring about a society in which there were no longer any MMAs left. Sadly, however, this is not what happened after the Prophet had died. Now, with that out of the way, let us incorporate these meanings into some other verses in which the phrase occurs. First, let us take a look at one of the verses which many people have taken to infer that the Quran permits the sexual assault against female war captives, namely verse 24 of chapter 4, which reads, Also those who are already handfasted in relationships among the women, excluding of course what your oaths have taken charge of. It is the prescription of God upon you. I have opted to render the term mosanet in this verse as those who are already handfasted in relationships. We have already covered the meaning of this term, so I will not be repeating it in this section, safe to say, the term is here taken to refer to those women who had limited their chastity to their spouses within the confines of marriage, meaning that they were already married. This, however, did not extend to the MMA who were already married. These women were permissible to marry once the marriage between them and their previous husbands was discontinued. Thus, the question is, why were these MMA permissible to marry? As stated earlier, some of the MMA came from terrible conditions, and there were others who had been war captives, but then they became Muslims. Some of these people found themselves in a situation where they were still married to their previous husbands, but they did not want to go back to them, as their husbands were in conflict with the messenger. They however wanted to marry again, but since they were still married to their husbands, they were unwary of what they were to do in this kind of situation. Thus, this verse was revealed in response to them, informing them that it was permissible for them to marry other husbands, once they had discontinued their marriage to their previous husbands, meaning that a divorce was issued between them and their husbands, even if their husbands were not present, as stated in chapter 60, verse 10, which reads, O people of the faith, when there comes to you the women of fidelity as emigrants, then put them to the test. If you then discover them to be faithful, 
then do not return them to those of dishonorable conduct. They are not lawful for the dishonorable people, and the dishonorable people are not lawful for them. This verse provides a screening process which determined whether the intent of those women who had escaped from their husbands was noble in them seeking asylum. The verse goes on to say, but give the dishonorable people what they spent. There is no issue upon you if you marry them, provided you give them their dowries. Meaning that, what those of dishonorable conduct had spent on these women, should be paid back to them, such as the dowries, now that their wives have discontinued their marriage from them. This same message is what is reiterated in verses 24 and 25 in chapter 4, but with a bit more details with the words, but permissible for you is whatever lies beyond that, provided of course that you seek them with your wealth as men who are intending chaste commitments in relationships, not as those who seek promiscuity and philandry. This is taken to mean that all other women aside from the already married women, including the already married ones from among the MMA, are lawful for you to marry, provided you seek them intending to give them their bridal compensations as men who are intending on living an honorable life of marriage, not as those who are seeking promiscuity. The verse concludes by stating that, whatever you may seek to enjoy thereby from them, then make sure to give them their bridal compensations as an obligation. There is no issue on you in whatever you have mutually agreed upon thereby after the obligatory meaning that whatever one may seek to enjoy from them in marriage thereby, then they have to make sure to give them their bridal compensations as an obligation. But there is no issue upon them in what they mutually have agreed upon after the obligation, meaning that if you happen to agree on something other than what is obligatory, then there is no problem on you going through with that agreement. Verse 25 then continues in that same light and lays out a way in which marriage with the MMA is supposed to take place. The verse states as follows, Whoever among you is not able to come up with the means to marry the documented faithful women, then they may marry from what your oaths have taken charge of from among your faithful maidens. This means that, whoever is not financially capable of marrying a faithful documented woman, then they may marry from among the faithful maidens of what their oaths had taken charge of. This would be equivalent to someone saying, whoever is not capable of finding the means to marry a faithful documented female, then let them marry from among the faithful maidens of the undocumented. This is understandable even in today's societies, as marrying a documented person within one's country is not the same as marrying an undocumented person. Typically, marrying a documented person costs way more than an undocumented person. That is because there is a less sense of entitlement in the undocumented when it comes to marriage, as they did not grow up with much, so they tend not to request much. They tend to be more reserved in their spending, rather than those who have been conditioned to expect a certain lifestyle of extravagance. Those who are documented might see themselves as high-value women, and as such, they might request more than what you are able to provide, so, the Quran here encourages those who are not financially capable of providing such a lifestyle to these women, that they should just marry from the MMA, as the MMA are typically not going to require more than the bare necessities, as they are accustomed to a life of moderateness and simplicity. This is, however, not to say that there is anything wrong with the documented women requesting what they view to be their value. Everyone is entitled to view themselves in however way they wish, and there is nothing inherently wrong with that, provided it is within reason. The verse then continues by stating, God is best knowing of your fidelity. You are from one another, so marry them with the permission of their families, and give them their bridal compensations in good conscience, they being of course exclusive in relationships, not as those who seek promiscuity and philandry, nor as those who are taken as concubines and sex slaves. Here, the verse stipulates that marriage to the MMA is supposed to be by the permission of their families, referring to those who had taken them in, and that their dowries had to be paid to them. This fact alone, that the custodians of the MMAs are described in this verse as family members, as opposed to their masters or owners, suggests that the MMA were never seen as property, rather as live-in members of the family. This can simply not suggest anything but love and care between the MMA and those in whose guardianship they were. 
This is also for the same reason why treatment of the MMA is supposed to be that of the highest caliber, namely that of excellence, similar to that which someone is expected to extend to one's parents and relatives, as stated earlier. By these women going through this process, they would thenceforth receive the documentation of fortification, i.e. they would become mosanet, meaning fortified by law through marriage. Furthermore, we are told that seeking such wedlock should be for the sake of desiring to live in the confines of a relationship of a committed nature, such as a marriage, not seeking promiscuity, nor as those who are to be taken as secret concubines or sex slaves. Here, we are told that if these women are to engage in such a relationship, then they should not do so for the sake of being taken as secret lovers or mistresses or to be used as a conduit for the men to spread their seed. Meaning, they should not be seeking men who are looking for secret lovers, men who do not want to commit to them, men who merely want to use them for sexual purposes such as in sexual slavery. Rather, it should be a commitment that they should seek. God has in this verse cautioned women who find themselves in a lesser class not to put themselves in situations where they might be taken advantage of and not treated in a way that is honorable. The verse then continues, then when they have become documented through marriage. If they then commit a sexual and moral offense, then for them is half of the punishment that is dealt upon the women who are documented by birth. This part of the verse grants leniency to these women if they commit an act outside their marital arrangements, which is that they are liable for half the penalty that is awarded to women who are fortified by law through naturalization, which in this case would be 50 lashes, rather than 100. The reason for this is due to the extenuating circumstances that these women came from, as well as what they had suffered throughout their lives. They did not enjoy the same luxuries or rights as those women who were naturally documented from birth. Some of them, if not most, had gone through terrible life circumstances throughout their lives, some unimaginable, therefore God decided to lessen their punishment in this verse for that very reason. The verse then concludes with the statement, That is for the one among you who is concerned about the act of sinning. But that you should remain patient would be better for you, though ultimately God is forgiving, merciful. The conclusion of this verse states that this exemption to marry the MMA is granted to those who are afraid of falling into sin, but if they remain patient, then that would be better. The sin being referenced here is referring to the act of sexual intercourse outside the confines of a committed relationship. If an individual is concerned that they may not have the fortitude or the willpower to restrain their sexual desires, then they were permitted to marry from the MMA. But even then, the Quran cautions that it would be better if they remained chaste, rather than marry them, if their sole intent was to satisfy their sexual desires, as this sort of mentality can lead to mistreatment. When the intent of marriage is strictly for sexual purposes, then this will not be enough to maintain a relationship, and it might lead to men mistreating their women. Once the sexual excitement quickly wears off, it will leave the couple with nothing to bond over and ultimately destroy the marriage. It is a message to those who seek marriage. If your sole intent for marriage is mainly to have sex and nothing else, then it is better that you do not get married, as that excitement will wear off very fast, and then you will be left regretting your decision, especially if the other party has taken a liking to you. You will end up mistreating your partner, even unintentionally, and you might not even ever come to know why that is the case. Refraining from marriage for those who are incapable is also re-emphasized in chapter 24, verse 33, which states, And let those people who are not able to find the means for marriage maintain abstinence until God enriches them of His grace. Meaning, if someone is not able to find the means to procure a relationship of a committed nature, then they are required to maintain their chastity until God has enriched them from His bounty, whereby they would be able to have the means to procure such a relationship. This verse also serves to dispel the argument of those who claim that the Quran supports sexual slavery. The verse clearly denies any relationship outside the confines of a marriage and instructs those who are not able to obtain such a relationship to maintain their chastity until God gives them the necessary requirements for such a relationship. This, however, does not necessitate the requirement to be that of wealth, 
rather it can also be of mental maturity, meaning that if someone is not mature enough to maintain and support such a relationship, then it would be better for them to observe abstinence until when they are mentally and physically ready to sustain such a relationship. But, if someone truly fears that they will otherwise fall into sin, but believe themselves to be mentally mature, then they may marry from the MMA, provided they give them their bridal compensations and marry them with the permissions of their families. Lastly, the verse informs us, as already mentioned, that this exemption to marry the MMA was for the one who feared falling into sin. So, if the Quran does support a practice such as sexual slavery or rape of war captives as postulated by certain people, then what sort of sin is being referred to that the person is afraid of falling into? If one could engage in sexual relations with the MMA without marriage and without the permission of the MMA, then what is it that one is afraid of falling into as mentioned in this verse, if not fornication? Both these two verses do not provide any outlets for sexual release outside the folds of marriage, marriage to either a documented person or an undocumented person from the MMA. There is no other option. So, what sin is then being referred to in the verse, if not the sin of fornication? Another verse that we can explore on the subject of the MMA is verse 50 and 52 of chapter 33, which state, O prophet, we have surely made lawful to you your wives to whom you have given them their bridal compensations, and what your right hand has taken charge of from what God has procured for you, and the daughters of your paternal uncles, the daughters of your paternal aunts, the daughters of your maternal uncles, and the daughters of your maternal aunts, who emigrated with you. Any woman with fidelity who gives herself to the prophet, if the prophet wanted to marry her, it is an exception for you, O Muhammad, excluding the faithful people. We surely know what we have already made obligatory upon them regarding their wives and what their right hands have taken charge of, in order that there should not be any issue upon you, O Muhammad, as God is ever forgiving, merciful. Those who claim that the Quran supports slavery have taken these verses to suggest that the Prophet had some carnal rights which other people of the faith did not have with regards to women. They base this on the statement of the verse which says, It is an exception for you, O Prophet, excluding the faithful, meaning that this is a right for you, O Muhammad, and not for the rest of the people of the faith. So, let us examine this claim a bit closer before we proceed to talk about the MMA in this verse. Let us ask ourselves a question, what right is the Prophet given in this verse that the other people of fidelity were not granted? Is it referring to God making the wives of the Prophet whom he had given them their dowries lawful for him? Did other people of the faith not have the same right? Or is it with regards to the MMA? Is it with regards to the Prophet being allowed to marry his paternal and maternal cousins? Or is it with regards to the Prophet being allowed to marry a woman if she gives herself to the Prophet? If not these, then with regards to what is the Prophet granted exclusivity which the other people of the faith were not granted? Is the exclusion limited to a category or to the entire verse? If it is to the entire verse, then this would imply that God has not made the wives whom the people of fidelity had given dowries permissible for them to marry, which in of itself is quite foolish, as that would imply that there is no such thing as a bridal compensation, and that only the prophet was mandated to give women their bridal compensation when he married them. Now, I do understand that there have been several attempts at suggesting that the exception in the verse refers to the prophet being allowed to marry more than four wives, or that the cousins mentioned are a reference to first cousins. I am well aware of all these points, but the problem is that the verse is unfortunately not as clear-cut as one may assume. I contend that the verse is not clear enough to even propose that it refers to all these four opinions, or to simply one of the four. However, there is a hint in the verse's ending that might suggest what the exception is regarding. The verse ends with the statement, We surely know what we have already made obligatory upon them regarding their wives and what their right hands have taken charge of, in order that there should not be any issue upon you, O Muhammad, as God is ever forgiving, merciful. This part of the verse informs us that God knows what he had already made obligatory upon the people of fidelity regarding their wives and their MMA. 
So, this verse can imply that the exception in the verse is regarding something which God had made obligatory upon the people of fidelity as it pertains to their wives and the MMA, but what then is that obligation? In chapter 4, verses 24 and 25, men have been obligated to give their future spouses their bridal compensations, regardless of whether they are from the documented or the undocumented women. In verse 24, it states, Whatever you may seek to enjoy thereby from them, then make sure to give them their bridal compensations as an obligation. There is no issue on you in whatever you have mutually agreed upon thereby after the obligatory. And in verse 25, it states, God is best knowing of your fidelity. You are from one another, so marry them with the permission of their families, and give them their bridal compensations in good conscience. Thus, in both these verses, marriage to either the documented or the undocumented women necessitates the presence of a dowry prior to the commencement of the marriage for the people of fidelity. So, the exception mentioned in the verse is most likely a reference to the unnecessity of a dowry for the prophet in certain marriages, meaning that if a woman offered herself to the prophet without the presence of a dowry, and the prophet wanted to marry her as a result, then he was allowed to marry her without a dowry, whereas the other people of fidelity were not given the same right. This exception, however, is not to suggest that if the prophet sought to marry a woman, that he was not obligated to give her the dowry, rather, it is exclusively talking about a case where a woman offers herself to the prophet in marriage without the presence of a dowry, then he was allowed to accept the marriage proposal from that woman. However, if he proposed marriage to a woman who had not offered herself to him, then he had to give her the dowry. There is nothing that suggests that the verse is pointing to a number of wives that the prophet was allowed to marry as some people have suggested. As for him being allowed to marry his first cousins, the verse merely says the daughters of your paternal and maternal uncles and aunts. There is nothing suggesting that this is a reference to first, second, or third cousins. Similarly, when the Quran states in chapter 4, verse 24, that, Whatever is besides that, referring to the list of women forbidden for marriage, is lawful for you people of the faith. This part of the verse clearly says that all women who are outside the list mentioned in verse 23 and partly verse 24 are lawful for the people of the faith, and surprisingly, there are no cousins mentioned in the list, whether it is first, second, or third cousins, which suggests that these women are lawful for marriage for the people of the faith. In my opinion, therefore, there is no Quranically sound reasoning to suggest that this verse is referring to first cousins. Some people have suggested that since the Quran appears to differentiate between the wives and the MMA, that this means that a person was not required to marry the MMA before engaging in sexual relations with them, but this is completely false and utterly ignorant, perhaps not intentionally ignorant, but ignorant nonetheless. We have already referenced verse 24 in chapter 4, which clearly states that in order to be with a woman from among the MMA, marriage was a necessity. If men were allowed to have sexual relations with them without the need to marry them, then what would be the point of informing the people of fidelity that they may marry the MMA if they didn't have the means to marry the already documented and fortified women? If they were already having sexual relations with them without the need to marry them, why would they need to marry them? The ability to feign ignorance by some of these people is sometimes astounding to the point of unbelievability. It seems that when it comes to the Quran, all of a sudden, their minds are completely shut and incapable of any line of reasoning. When your understanding of the text is not in line with reason, nor with the text you claim to question, then perhaps the fault is with your own understanding, rather than the text. I did not cover every single verse with the concept of the MMA, but I believe my point is already made. Feel free to watch my video on slavery, as I go into more detail on the subject and comment on many of the other verses in which this phrase occurs. Write your comments down below if you have any questions to what I have presented. If it is something I have already answered in these videos, then please do watch both videos before commenting, as it might be that I have already answered that question. Otherwise, feel free to comment.
Remember to subscribe and like the video, and I will see you in the next video. Happy New Year everyone, and I wish you all the very best.